Building DIY projectors, excluding smartphone projectors, is quite a niche thing and I never really considered building one until I saw this. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, today the focus is going to be building DIY purchases, DIY projector. And I'm going to just leave some timestamps up for your convenience, but without further ado, let's just hop right into it. Okay, so I'm just going to go over uh, briefly some of the parts. I'm not going to go into deep uh, detail into about it. Um, for those of you who skipped, um, who skipped this part, um, we still want them to be able to understand what's happening. So here I have four uh, threaded rods. Um, and well, I'll, I'll get into more detail about them later, but these are 1 fourth inch and uh, 20 uh, teeth per inch. And this is the US standard, um, which is pretty close to the M6. Uh, the metric system but you can't mix the two obviously i've tried the hard way um, and learned the hard way that that won't work um, and this will be supporting our aluminum layers so i just have eight of these and i'll again get into more detail about them later but i do have four holes drilled in them and uh yeah moving on in no particular order here i have an led uh, this is a chip on board LED, a COB LED, and this one is super tiny. It's smaller than my uh, index finger. Um, and uh, I bought this off of UG LEDs, um, but it was it was a little more expensive. But you can't, it, it, you will see some real benefit out of it um, because this one uh, is 95 plus CRI at 100 watts. Um, you can buy them off of Amazon, but they will be slightly bigger, which will affect the rest of your build. But I will get into that later. So, uh, we need to cool that with a, oh, looky here. We have a nice big heat sink. Okay, let me move these dirty rods. They're just taking away all the fame and glory. Okay, so here we have a uh, CPU heat sink, or cooler, I guess. Um, and you can see I've already attached two fans. Um, this is the most exciting part because, well, it's from PC. So, also, let me put this aside very carefully. Uh, also, this is the one thing you can overspend a little bit on because you don't want your LED to blow up because it really is pretty easy to blow this up uh, if you don't cool it properly. It needs to stay under 60 degrees Celsius. So to power that, we have an LED or a step-up board, uh, also known as a voltage regulator. Uh, we have a voltage step down board to power the fans because um, you need to step it down to like 12 volts for most fans. Um, and you might need more than one if you have like a phone or an LCD display, which is what I have here. Um, it comes with an HDMI control board, but keep in mind this is micro HDMI. Keep, in, keep that in mind when you're buying it. Um, this is a MyPi to HDMI inverter, I believe. Um, this is, it comes with speakers, which is a kind of an added bonus. And I'm not, I'm not going to take it out now, uh, cause you, uh, I should not be trusted around these things. Moving on, we have, well, we have a large format lens here. Um, and this will vary depending on, uh, like the length, like your Fresnel lenses and stuff like that. But I'll get into more detail about that later. Uh, so I just mentioned Fresnel lens, I should probably get that out. Uh, so here are the Fresnel lens and it's just a mess right now, but... Um, well, this one's, I think this one's the, well, just, I'll, I'll get in more detail about them later, but I have two of them, um, and they're just, they're the ones that kind of, uh, well, you know, bend the light rays. Uh, okay, I think that's, uh, many of the major parts. I didn't go over the small stuff like the nuts and screws and pillar spacers and things like that, but I will go over that as we progress through the build, which I think we can start right now. Let's get into it. Okay, so for those of you who just uh, skipped to the build, first thing you're gonna do is get one of these pillar spacers. Focus, okay, there we go. Um, and this is about uh, two centimeters long, uh, 1.8 millimeter, or 1.8 centimeters, I believe. Um, and you just kinda wanna thread it onto your threaded rod. Um, and a threaded, this threaded rod is just, it's 1 fourth inch by 20 teeth per inch. Uh, it's approximately equal, equivalent to M6. Um, the metric system. Um, I'm just gonna be upfront with you. It's really, it takes a while to thread this on. And mine is a meter long, or, or almost a meter long. It's 36 inches. Um, so once you have that, and, and you don't need all the entire meter, you just need part of that. 
So once you have that, you can also get some donuts. Oh, I think this is far too in. You also want some donuts, do not donuts, dome nuts, um, which they're just normal nuts, but they have like a dome on the end. I'm so descriptive. All right, so you just want to kind of get this here, balance it magically, and cap it off. All right, so that first step took way longer than I expected, but I finally got it on there. It's fairly tight, um, and you can see that this could actually be very, uh, a very good feat. A feat? A feat. So you just need four of these um, clamped in place like this. So you do yours while I do mine. Well, if you're following along, but... Okay, it took a while, but I finally got four, uh, four of these rods uh, screwed on. You can see uh, the dome nuts, hopefully. Um, and also, you can also probably see that I added um, some pillar supports here, or pill spa pillar spacers uh, here. Um, well, two of them. Um, and you should probably have both of these on um, before putting the dome nuts on, because after you do, you're gonna have to go through the entire meter and I can tell you, I mean, it doesn't, it takes like two minutes, but it, it's really a waste of time. So, uh, yeah, so, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, uh, you can drill these holes nicer by like having an X here. Um, and from the center measure, like probably 12.8 uh, centimeters um, from this to the corner and uh, drill like three millimeters first and then six millimeters um, and then step it up a little more if you need to uh, squeeze in your rod. So uh, mine was like seven or eight millimeters, um, but it got through and it was almost perfect. So just find that happy medium for you. Now we can also uh, add in our second layer, which is um, gonna ho hold our um, uh, heat sink. Okay, almost there, come on, almost there. Hopefully I'm not destroying the thread. It shouldn't, it's pretty, this one's pretty small. Uh, make sure yours is pretty strong as well because this has to be very sturdy um, and nice So I'm just gonna make sure it's all the way down and now you can actually add in your you can just check out How your heat sink kind of lines up. Okay, so as you can see here, uh, I just kind of zoomed out a little bit um, here I have the, the, the heat sink set up and everything so you just want to thread four nuts to um, about this level um, with the, the heat sink so that you can um, add on the next layer um, and then use uh, some screws to hold it on. Here you can see uh, it's pretty loose, but once I add the screws and the nuts on the other side, um, it should it should be fine. Um, so if your heat sink might be a little different. Just find a way to kind of clamp it on there. And uh, also, if you can see down there, uh, whoops, don't mind this. This is just a DIY uh, stand that I made. So you can probably see the cardboard. But uh, this needs to be about four centimeters here, which is why I used two of them. I didn't explain it, but whoops, that's what it is. So yeah, uh, on with the build. Um, yeah, just remember use the um, nuts to kind of align this up as well. So uh, that's probably gonna take a while too. All right, so one important thing I should mention is that uh, you might notice I have a hole here and that's for wires to pass through later. Um, approximately six to probably eight wires. It depends on um, what you use, like a phone or an LCD panel, but um, you do need a hole um, and make sure it's kind of smoothened out. Uh, maybe use a file, something. This one probably needs to be widened a little bit um, so yeah, that's that's one important thing. Another thing I do want to briefly go over is how this projector's layout is kind of gonna be. So um, first you have your layer with the heat sink on it, um, then you, which is cooling an LED. Then, then you kind of have like a Fresnel lens um, that will make, uh, that's at its focal point. Um, and it'll collimate the light rays, which make, means it'll make it parallel. Um, and uh, it, it'll kind of shine through a second Fresnel lens, um, which, is, um, which, is just, uh, which just makes it con uh, converging, um, makes the light rays converging. So it converges, and then um, the LCD panel also is gonna be like um, right here, um, and then the light's just gonna shine and illuminate that, and it'll be going through a projection lens, 
And since this thing, um, I'm planning to mount this thing horizontally, um, I really don't need a front surface mirror. However, that means I'm gonna have to make the LCD panel um, inverted. So I'm just gonna have to, from like this, it's just gonna have to be like this, um, which really isn't a big deal. Um, removing that mirror also means removing some weight and an additional layer. So if you have a front surface mirror, you're going that way, then you need nine aluminum layers, not eight. Um, so yeah, that's just a quick brief thing to mention. Uh, so yeah, we can just continue on with this build. All right, so at this point you can start prepping your LED layer. Um, this is where your LED is gonna be uh, mounted on. So this is a layer of the LED. And you can see there's quite a few things going on. So first you have a vent slot along one edge. And um, this is like the start of um, a cooling path um, provided by our heat sinks um, fans right here. Um, and these these kind of blow air outward and the, it blows through like um, the vents and um, it'll hopefully keep everything cool. Um, I'll get into more detail about the cooling system later, um, but um, there's more holes here. You can see one, two, three, four for the for the LED to be mounted to the heat sink. Um, and then two holes for the positive and negative negative wires to pass through once we have the LED mounted. And then obviously a hole for the LED itself. Now, speaking of the LED, um, there's really different types of cob LEDs you'll find out there, which is what this is. Um, this is, um, and this specific one is 100 watts. It's It has a CRI color rendering index of 95. Um, color temperature of 5200 kelvins and um, I think it, the brightness is around 9000 lumens um, It's pretty s compact and small um, I do know that there's another um, LED um, from UG LEDs called um, Well, it's the same thing, but it's just slightly smaller and its color temperature is 5600 kelvins um, so that's another viable option. I'll try to leave links to all of these things in the, in the description. Um, this I actually got off of Amazon. Um, you can actually buy these off of eBay, but they're generally used and stuff like that. Um, so you, there, it's not a guarantee that it might actually work. That all being said, this is how the final LED layer looks like. And as you can see, I've added a lot of insulation with electrical tape to prevent any short circuits. Now we can add the LED layer to right above where the heatsink will be later. It's also not a bad idea to screw or cable tie in a voltage booster for the LED and a voltage step down board for the fans. Although make sure your heatsink and fans leave enough room for these boards to be mounted securely. While we're on the subject of voltage regulators, now's probably a good time to explain how to power the LED and fans. I already explained what the specs of the LED need to be, but the fans are just two 120mm PC case fans. So let's start with powering the LED. If you have an LED driver, then you're good to go. Although I'll admit, I don't know the details of powering an LED with an LED driver, so you might want to check beforehand if you decide to go this route. The method I used is using a voltage booster. The way I powered the LED is by first setting the voltage value of the voltage booster below the LED's rated voltage. To do this, I turned this trimmer clockwise and monitored the output voltage with a multimeter. You would have to do something similar since not all voltage boosters have these trimmers arranged in a similar fashion. A few things to note before proceeding is to remember to not look directly at the LED for obvious reasons and making sure all exposed wires are insulated with electrical tape and and also keep the LED on the heatsink while powering it so it, it can at least be passively cooled. After checking these things you can hook up your LED to the voltage booster and increase the voltage, again monitoring it with the multimeter. Once you have adjusted it to its rated voltage, measure how many amps the LED is drawing. This is slightly different from measuring voltage, so if you don't know how to do it, you can look at this diagram. Once you've confirmed it's reached its spec current, your LED and voltage booster are ready to go. If it doesn't draw enough amperage, you would have to turn this trimmer and increase the amperage that the booster can provide. To cap it at this value, turn the knob in the opposite direction slightly. Powering the fans is much simpler. For PWM fans, there are four wires. The PWM wire, the TAC wire, the power wire, and the ground wire. The wires we need are power, positive, and ground, negative. The general rule of thumb is that the ground wire is the leftmost or rightmost wire, and power is right next to it. 
Same goes for 3-pin fans, except there is no PWM wire. Once you've found these wires, which might take some trial and error, you can then set the voltage of the step-down board to the fan's rated voltage. In most cases, it will be 12 volts. See, powering stuff is easy peasy. Actually, since it's electricity, be careful and do all of the things that don't end up in a big explosion. On that happy note, you can add a pea-sized drop of thermal paste on the heat sink, put your LED through its hole, and screw the Oh, I think this script is a wee bit messed up. And screw the heatsink to the LED layer, which should result in the LED and heatsink being clamped tightly in place. Now that we have our light source mounted, we can now start working on the Fresnel lens. As was shown in the diagram earlier, we're going to have two Fresnel lenses in our build. The first Fresnel lens should have a focal length of about 90mm, and the second one should have a focal length greater than that of your projection lens. I'll go into a little more detail about this later, but for now take it that you need a Fresnel lens with a focal length of approximately 160mm. It might take a while to get these depending on where you live, as most of them ship from China. That all being said, you can now slide down your first Fresnel lens with its grooves facing upward. Make sure the distance from your LED to the Fresnel lens is the Fresnel lens's focal length. This is just to make sure it is in the optimal position to collimate the light rays. Note that I also added a vent slot along the opposite edge compared to the LED layer. This is just so that the air from the fans goes in a zigzag pattern. You can now slide down the second Fresnel lens, but this time with its grooves facing downward, since this is the converging lens and it condenses the light rays and makes the capturing of light even more efficient. Again, don't forget the vent slot. Now that we have complete control over our light rays, let's move on to our focusing system, which probably includes the most make or break part of our system, the image source. The first part of our focusing system is the most modest part of our build, but you can still see that there's quite a few things going on here. The first of which is a large cutout for light to pass through, which will need a piece of acrylic covering it to force air to go through the vent slot. The second thing you can see here is that there's a lot of holes. These six holes will have some M3 pillar spacers screwed onto them, you may have also noticed that I made the holes for the threaded rods bigger to make it easier to move up and down. What we want to achieve here is to have this layer as well as the LCD layer to arise and fall evenly. To accomplish this, we'll be using what are known as GT2 timing belt pulleys with an accompanying GT2 timing belt. These are common in CNC devices such as 3D printers and CNC routers, so pretty cool stuff those pulleys. What we want is to have the GT2 pulleys threaded onto the threaded rods, but as the pulleys aren't internally threaded, we need to put some threaded inserts in them and clamp it in place with the grip screws. When you do this, make sure your GT2 pulley has a big bore, so you don't have to file down the threaded insert and basically wage war against it to make it fit. So a 10mm bore would work excellently, although you still might have to file down the threaded insert. When you slide down this layer, you don't need any nuts, since this is obviously meant to move up and down freely. Although you could still thread some nuts through if you knew exactly where the, your LCD layer needs to be positioned. This could be useful if the projector isn't going to be moved much and the focus adjusted often. You can now thread on the new and improved GT2 pulley, but you may need to add some washers to align all five of them. You can see on this M3 player spacer, I've added another GT2 pulley, and this will be externally accessible later to adjust the focus. The last step for this layer is to add the GT2 timing belt, which in my case was exactly 94 centimeters long, although yours might be slightly different. So now we can finally start working on the image source. As I've mentioned many times over the build so far, our image source is an LCD panel. There are a few shortcomings with this part, so do stick around for the part where I explain the challenges during the build. The image source must be an LCD panel because light has to be able to shine through said image source, which means something like an OLED display won't work for our use case. However, we still have to remove the backlight of the LCD display to allow as much light to shine through as possible. Usually this involves lifting out the various layers like Fresnel lenses and diffusion layers and carefully disconnecting the backlight strip to stop the LEDs from lighting up. Be careful as to not remove the polarizing layer that's stuck to the back of the screen since then you won't be able to see anything on the display. The only way to see anything on the panel is to shine light through it, meaning that we can now mount it on its own layer. The way we can power this is by using, you guessed it, a voltage step down board set to the LCD panel's rated voltage. Also, don't forget to make the top of this layer black, since this is the layer that's brought into focus by our projection lens. You can now screw this layer to the M3 pillar spacers from the previous layer. This now holds the GT2 pulleys between the two layers, which means that if the main pulley is turned, all of the pulleys turn in the same fashion, which results in both layers rising and falling evenly. With the focusing system out of the way, we can now move on to the projection lens. 
first thing to consider before choosing a lens is its image circle. We will need a lens type known as large format. This is an old type of lens, but it's the only type of lens that will cover the entire LCD panel with ease. Another thing to consider is the lens's focal length. As I mentioned earlier, the projection lens needs a focal length shorter than that of the second Fresnel lens, so the ideal focal length would be about 135mm. The aperture of the lens is also important, as this dictates how much light a lens lets through. If you have a small 16mm LED, then an f8 lens or more would work fine. If you have a larger LED, then you would need something like an f4 lens. We can now mount it on its own layer, and slide it down in place. Make sure it is positioned at the best distance from the second Fresnel lens. You can test this before you mount the LCD layer by moving the projection lens up and down until there is no aberration or vignetting, but instead a plain white rectangle. You can then take note of the measurement from the second Fresnel lens to the projection lens and slide it down in place. And with that, the inner part of the projector is complete. We're almost done, and a couple of things to do before closing it up is adding a power socket for our power brick to plug into, and adding the fans to the heatsink which need to push air outward. To close it up, we need more aluminum sheets, some with various vent slots for air to enter through, and a hole for the power socket to fit into. Since our fans are blowing air outward, there's a slight negative pressure, meaning that air will enter through any holes in the chassis. So, after wrapping the aluminum sheets in vinyl wrap, you can cover the vent slots in speaker fabric to prevent dust from entering along with the cool air. During my testing, I realized that this passive cooling approach caused my LCD panel to develop a nasty dark spot in the middle. So, to rectify this, I added another fan that pulls air in and effectively cools the panel. Another thing to mention is that the speaker fabric does let quite a bit of light escape, so you can just add a piece of cardboard or aluminum with a gap in between to allow air in but also block all the light. You can also cover the projection lens with a sheet of acrylic to prevent dust from entering that way as well. To put on the side panels, you can use these clips that I found on Amazon. Once you've cut off the unnecessary threaded rod and capped it off with some dome nuts, our DIY projector is finally finished. Now, uh, while I did manage to show you how I built this in about 30 minutes, um, there are quite a few challenges. So um, here are some tips and tricks that I um, came up with that you can use some to uh, save some time and stress. Um, so tip number one, try to get most of your parts off of a retailer that you personally trust. Um, so this might mean like searching for a bit longer, um, but it really does pay off in the long run um, because it, it, it's someone familiar and you kind of know how to deal with them and stuff like that. Um, so tip number two, uh, don't underestimate the cutting and drilling involved in uh, making this thing uh, because there's a lot of it and there's going to be a lot of time and effort that's going to be spent into doing the cutting and drilling. I mean, I bought some pre-cut eight inch aluminum sheets and I still had to spend a week just cutting and drilling. Um, I mean, even after that, I still had to cut and drill some more. So make sure you have a good jigsaw and drill that are up for the task. So tip number three, use the measurement system of your country. So uh, for, the, for the US, Burma, and Liberia, um, that's the imperial measurement system. And for uh, everyone else, uh, I envy you, it is the metric system. So for example, if you live in Germany, then you would use the metric system for your uh, threaded rods and the nuts that go on it. The reason being that you can get these at your local store instead of like um, dealing with an international seller or products that ship from another country. And to just keep things simple. Let's see, um, another thing is to try and test the circuitry um, before actually mounting it in the chassis um, because once you mount it in there, there's no there's no getting it out. Um, or there is getting it out, but it just it just takes more time. A place where you can really save some time though is with the power supply. So here it is. Uh, here's my power supply. So you might be able to scrape by if you get like a 120 watt power supply, um, but to allow yourself some ample headroom to power this thing, um, you really should aim for 150 watts. Um, which is what this is. It's actually uh, 19 and a half volts and uh, two in, or uh, seven seven point seven amps, um, which is enough to drive this build. You don't want anything less because then you have like then you have like inefficient um, transformations. 
um, because I believe at like 80% load, it's, um, or yeah, 80% load, it's, um, not as efficient or something like that. So, um, you really, you really want to aim for 150 Watts. The voltage and the amperage that the power brick provides must be in the ideal range. So, um, if it varies slightly depending on what LED you get, but a good voltage to target is like, is like uh, 16 volts um, to 19 and a half volts. Um, the reason being that the amperage provided must be enough for all the components to draw. So there has to be enough current for all the components to draw. Thing number five, try to get a Fresnel lens that will fit on your aluminum layer. I know this sounds silly, but I actually had to cut my second Fresnel lens um, because it was too big to fit on the alum aluminum layer um, without like protruding out or anything. So try to get one that fits on your uh, aluminum sheet without you having to cut it because cutting is a grueling process. The part where I had the most trouble though is with the LCD panel. I learned the hard way that LCD panels only work with a computer and nothing else. So if you're plugging in a laptop, you're pretty much good to go. Uh, laptop is an HDMI input. Um, then you're good to go, but if you want to try to plug this into an AVR as a pass-through device or as a TV stick as an input, uh, don't bother because like 99.9999% of LCD panels with control boards uh, won't display anything. A way around this is to actually use your laptop and sign into Netflix or whatever streaming services you use. And then you can connect your laptop to external speakers or an AVR for good audio um, via Bluetooth. Um, it's a pretty good solution, but um, there is there will be a slight lag because it's Bluetooth. It's not a wired connection um, and things like that, but you can still get good audio. It's, it's still worth it. If you want a 4K LCD panel, however, it can take a while to get it, four weeks for me actually, um, because they all ship from China. If you're okay with waiting four weeks or maybe even longer, um, is it's, it, then it's okay. It's, it's good. You can wait that long, get a 4k panel and be happy. But the most important thing though, is to add a fan to actively cool the LCD panel. Cause if you don't, you will get like a nasty dark spot in the middle of the LCD panel and, uh, dark spots and spots that appear and gradually grow, grow bigger. That's not generally a good thing like ever. Um, and the options really aren't great, so you might as well just add a fan and uh, call it a day. Well, you can't really call it a day. You still have to close things up, and it takes a while to close things th close things up um, using these because it it might be a two person job, uh, depending depending on how you do it. Um, so that's just my two cents. Uh, I hope you found that useful. Uh, and now we can finally test this thing. All right. So here you can see I have uh, a video pulled up. Uh, and the reason it looks so grainy is because it's so dark in here and the cameras uh, can't really work that well in the dark. So it looks a little grainy, but in person, uh, the pixels are pretty small. All right, so here's a projector and it's projecting pretty fine. Now it is pretty dim, so you want to make sure that you have everything blacked out so you can see it's dark outside. Uh, there's no lights on, uh, otherwise it'll kill the image. Now another benefit of this is that it's really, really silent. So I'm going to take the microphone like super close to this. All right, so I'm going to take it super close. Here's the fan. So as you hopefully saw, this thing is really impressive for something that you built at home. A huge thank you to you if you made it this far. I know it was a little difficult to watch at the beginning, and that's just a side effect of the project taking five months to make. Also, thanks to DIY Perks, as this originally was and is his idea, so I'll of course leave a link to his channel in the description, as well as all the parts that he used for this build. But yeah, this was a huge learning curve for me, and I hope it was for you too. So if you did enjoy this video, you can hit like, but if you didn't, of course, I'll understand if you want to hit that dislike button, but if you liked it, hit like and get subscribed so you don't miss out on uh, DIY projects like this and uh, tech content uh, that's on the way. But other than that, I will see you in the next video.